Uh, Ren, I, I want to start with you because you're usually one of the first, uh, uh, of this group, you would have been the first brought on to the project and you've worked with David for, what, some 25, 26 years now? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, sound in this movie, you know, we, when, when people talk about sound, mixing, sound editing, you know, they, uh, all the kudos seem to go to the really loud pictures and the ones with the big explosions and everything else. But sound is critical in this film. There is so much dialogue. Most of it is overlapping. Um, kind of give us a sense, uh, when David first, first approached you, did he send you the script? And, and did you guys have some initial discussions before he even went into production? Or, or Yeah, he, we did. I mean, he... He was really excited about the dialogue and the, and the snappy script uh, that was written. And um, and he really was concerned about, you know, he knew that he was we were going to be jumping around in location a lot, so he wanted to, to set that. But he was actually most excited about music in those uh, in original conversations, believe and, it or not. And did he make, like, references to any kind of uh, popular music from that time or maybe from an, an earlier time? Um... Yeah, he did. He started talking about electronic music scores, and he he was really um, he 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 wanted to ha to make the film kind of feel like a film that when we were you know eighteen, nineteen years old, the movies that we were seeing at the time, you know, like Chariots of Fire, and, and that feeling, you know, Blade Runner and this music and sort of synthesizers and this tone. But he wanted to have a modern version of it. So that's actually what he would call up and talk about most of the time, and wa and wanting to get. Uh, these folks involved. So uh, had he mentioned uh, Trent and Atticus uh, early on to you when he was making the musical references or? He did actually. He was very excited about um, getting to work with Trent and um, uh, and he would, he call, oh God, what, what do you think of what, what, synthesizers, like, these, like something percolating, what, just, <laughs> we gotta get Trent involved. I'm like, that sounds great. So you know, he was, ve he was very much wanting to talk about music almost exclusively right off the bat. You know, Trent, I was kind of shocked that you and David really hadn't uh, worked on a film before. You know, uh, you guys have known each other for a while. Uh, yeah, just over the years, various things in the same kind of circle. You know, yeah. I'd always thought his videos were great. And then he directed one video for Nine Inch Nails, for the but, track only. But, but not way back in the beginning. It was just, it was actually relatively recently uh, or? Um, yeah, it was like 2005, I think, yeah. is when he did that. Because he used he used that one version uh, uh, in the opening credits, uh, not your version, I don't think, but the uh, of Closer. Coyle's version uh, uh, of the, yeah. um, Closer and Seven. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, that stunning opening yeah, credit sequence that Angus Wall put together for him. So um, so when you first heard about this, when, when David first approached you, um, had he started shooting yet at this point? Or this were been you around... <laughs> It was about a year ago, ish. Yeah. Um, maybe it was earlier than that, summerish. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'd just gotten off, or was getting off tour, which I'd been on it seemed like forever, for several years, and he had not shot the film yet. But uh, we met, and he introduced the idea of working on this, and I was excited about it. But I was kind of in a place where I didn't think. I mean, after I spent a week really thinking about it. Um, I just I'd made a promise to myself not to um, take on work that I wasn't sure I wanted to do, and I just spent several years touring, and I just got married, and I really had made a promise I was going to just let my brain cool off for a little while. And um, I liked the script. I'd always wanted to work with David, but I didn't feel I didn't have the confidence to. Um, commit to something that was a new discipline for me, because I'd never done this before, properly scoring a film. And I didn't want to blow it, and I also didn't want to spend a nightmarish year of trying to figure out how to um, to do that. So I reluctantly said, you know, um, I have to pass on this, because I really don't think I can give you my best work right now. And had you read Aaron's script at that yeah. point? You had, so. Now, I knew it was going to be great, <laughs> and I understood why David wanted to be involved with it and work and do that movie. Um, I just, I was lacking confidence at the time. Then jump ahead a couple months, um, Atticus, who I've worked with for about 10 years now on various projects, from his band 12 Rounds, to my band Nine Inch Nails, to our band How to Destroy Angels, we had started working on something, and um, like I was mentioning to you earlier, my job is usually half the time is spent executing 
in a physical way being on tour, which is not a lot of creativity. It's a lot of um, tedium and just execution. And then the other half of my job is sitting around thinking and creating, and that's, that's the more rewarding part. Um, but when you switch from one side to the other, it usually takes a while for the, for the switch to flip the right way. Anyway, right the first of this year, um, we had started working on How to Destroy Angels, and it really went well. And I felt really bad about saying what I said to uh, David, so I called him back up and said, you know, again, it's not the material, but I just wasn't in a good place. But keep me in mind for anything in the future. And he said, come by and see and edit, and let's, let's do this. I'm waiting for you. Uh, now, had uh, Atticus, you'd, you'd already done a score on your own, uh, the book of Eli for the Hughes brothers. Had you kind of shared your experiences with Trent, uh, maybe trying to twist his arm to, uh, <coughs> I mean? Well, when he first mentioned to me that you know, that David had brought it up, which was before he asked me to be involved. Oh. I certainly encouraged him, you know, a few months earlier, because I was excited to hear what he'd do. You know, and, and, cert and also my experience that I had had, you know, I mean, on both the films, have, I've really, really loved doing it. So I certainly said, you know, and I thought, you know, anyone who's familiar with Nine Inch Nails would be excited to hear you know, that against picture. Yeah. And I was talking to you guys earlier, and I, and I thought it was fascinating how you guys kind of describe the difference between when you get together to work on an album or a song as opposed to working on a film. Can you guys kind of break that down for us and kind of take us into the exploratory uh, process uh, for each, each, each creative act? Sure. Um. The way Atticus and I work is a result of years of figuring each other out. And it's to the point now where we have a vocabulary where we can um, really communicate without words. And I think the part of our brains that don't work are complemented by the other guy has that function that does work. He's more organized in a lot of ways than I am. I have things he doesn't have. Like I'm really talented, he's not so much. <laughs> <laughs> he's the yin to your yang. <laughs> But anyway, um, <laughs> when we start a project, um, like for this, for example, what we'll, what we'll usually do, it's, it's mainly it's just us two in a room full of equipment. And because there's not, um, say if we were a band, uh, like uh, the Rolling Stones, that band has a sound. Those people give that music an identity. And I think when they write songs, it organically kind of comes out the way it sounds because that's what those guys sound like, for the most part, speaking generally. Um, with us, it's we've found over the years that if we put up creative, creative um, limitations and rules, um, for example, with the How to Destroy Angels record that we did, we, we focused on it having um, a very synthetic rhythmic section. We wanted it to feel kind of dark and a little bit dirty, but we wanted it to have a beauty to it, not be abrasive, but have a kind of um, sexiness and that tells us in the language of instrumentation that we'll probably use these instruments and start that way. And then when we start actually working on it, we might find that, uh, and we often do, that hey, this isn't as exciting as playing it on the piano, for example. And then we modify that rule to go that direction. For this film, you know, I came into this not really knowing how to do it, you know, and very humble and wanting to, first and foremost, serve David's needs of what he was looking for for this. And I, so I asked myself, what, why is he asking me to do this? What kind of music um, does this film need? And wh what does he want from me to serve that need? Um, if this was Seven, for example, it would be more in what I would consider familiar emotional territory mm -hmm. than a movie about guys creating things in a room and the results of them you know, screwing each other over. So um, the first thing I did was really listen to what David had to say. And, and it, like Ren mentioned, he, he mentioned um, iconic synthetic type uh, soundtracks of the past. Um, we right off the bat decided not to use an orchestra, and we wanted it to feel a bit more, um, a bit less conventional. And then um, not working off any picture, Atticus and I saw maybe 40 minute rough cut um, with just music tempt in that Ren and David had and, done. And what, what had they used as, as temp tracks? 
There's a couple pieces of music from the Ghosts Nine Inch Nails record that Atticus and I had worked on a few years earlier. And then there was some just miscellaneous stuff, you know, kind of... Um, were, were these tracks that you had put in, Ren, or, or that Angus Wall and Kirk Baxter... That original Kitchen round was stuff that Angus had put in. Okay. So we saw that rough bit of the film, and I was familiar with the script, but now it's, I'd, I've gotten a vibe for the pace and what it looks like in general the tempo of the words. And it, it struck me the challenge is gonna be how do we fit music into a very word talky filled picture that has to move at that rate so it's not a four hour film. And, and what was the level of the sound design at that point when you saw that first 40 minutes of rough cut? I don't remember m much, I mean, the basics. You know, okay. it really, it was just an, in the editing suite, here's an idea of what's going on. David stopped it after maybe 40 minutes or so and said, you get the idea. And then um, Atticus and I just went back to our studio and sat around thinking, okay, what are the emotional parameters of what we think could fit in this? Not, not knowing exactly what David wants or not knowing how far away from safety we can get, there's a safe zone. And then we spent a couple weeks really just generating music blindly, not for any specific scene. And the idea when I sent them to David was just, hey, here's a, here's a collection of swatches, just you know, tape them on the wall. See if anything resonates with you, see if anything feels like it's in the right ballpark. And we well, can- when, when you guys do that, are you, are you like guys like playing chords or motifs or what, how, are you, how does that work between the two of you? I mean, are, are you sitting at the keyboards and Atticus is at a synthesizer or, and you're, you're, you're just playing with stuff? Or, I mean, I think that's, the, the, we're real curious, you know, how does that, how does it actually come out of nothing? I mean, I know that you guys have talked about emotions and the drive of the story, but, you know, do you, do you sit down and start playing piano first? Is that, is that kind of where it starts to evolve? Um. When we worked on the Ghosts record for Nine Inch Nails, that's a two-hour instrumental freeform composition record where we had a rule in place where we'd do, we'd finish a track every day from inception to mix, done, at least one. And the, what we did for that would be, I would start with a, a visual. I, I made that, I was, the idea of that was to be soundtracks for films that don't exist. I'd think of a place like a, a swampy pier in New Orleans, for example. And then I would describe that verbally and start playing something just from a very subconscious place, not thinking in terms of pop music or structure or choruses or verses or hits, just in terms of impression. And try to dress, dress the stage with sound and not put anything in the, uh, if I was writing a pop song, the center stage would be the vocal or the narrative of the song. I just address the set, leave the center empty, but you as a listener kind of fill that in. How we would technically work would be generally I play the stuff and generally he sorts through hours of stuff and arranges it into a logical thing that would be much better than if I tried to do that myself because I'm also so close to what I'm doing and usually irritated at myself by the end of it because I, I, I've struggled to get it out. He can then um, balance that out with an arrangement that um, I can leave the room for an hour or two, come back, and think, who did that? You know, it came well, out of you, things you, I played. You know, we go ahead. There's, there's, when Trent's playing, it's not like there's a shortage of, <laughs> you know, ideas. And it could go from many instruments in, you know, an hour. Generally, like, how we'll work is I'll just be recording Trent on loop record, so it's endlessly recording. Does he typically start with keyboards, or, or there's could no, it be there's anywhere? There's, there's no to typical be. start. Yeah. Um, and and w with the, uh, you know, like in the social network context, it wasn't like just blind in the sense of, you know, you know, clear ideas in terms of, you know, the story on the level of, you know, Facebook, the creativity and that energy, and also a sort of lonely journey of, you know, Zuckerberg, um, that could be interpreted in different ways as, 
you know, to the individual, but we were working from a place, and I think Trent was coming at it from this, you know, place of having some set ideas. Um, and then each track, like you said, would be this case of this, that, 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 that. And then it's kind of like playing with his ideas, if you like. And, and what we'll do sometimes, like on a per track basis, is set up, here's a guitar that's tuned oddly, that you can't, these certain frets don't work. I know it's sitting there, I know it has a sound that we dialed up. Here's a prepared piano that has actual clothes pins on the strings and um, maybe something else. It's rhythmic of some sort. And then just start recording and the idea of this is what I have to make a song with or make something that sounds interesting with. That'll be that track. Sometimes it's just sitting at a piano and coming up with an idea that feels uh, satisfying harmonically. And then we'll build on it and arrange it from there. But like he was saying, it, it really, for social network, we, we just tried to analyze some of the emotional content of what we thought the characters were feeling, you know. Um, well, if, if we could, I'd like to go to the very opening of the film, which starts with that, that dialogue scene in the bar. Uh, and, Ren, maybe you can speak to this, because I know that, you know, usually it's very easy to understand dialogue, even if we're put into a place where there's a bar and there's loud music, whatever. But it's like, right from the very first frame, it's kind of like you have to sit up and take notice and go, I better pay attention. I mean, this this may not be the easiest film to follow, but I think we're in for a ride there. And then once he we go to that exterior shot of the bar, and we hear those first notes of the piano. And I mean, it's it's an extraordinary transition. Can you talk about the what David's intent was? Um, in setting the tone or kind of setting the rules sure. in that well, first scene? At the beginning scene, you're absolutely right. I mean, he wanted... Aaron's script was so weird. I mean, if you actually read the screenplay there, the dialogue sort of hop skips, it, a frog leaps. So he'll Zuckerberg will say something about, did you know there's a certain number of people with genius IQs in China? And then she'll say something else and... Then he starts talking about himself, and she says, "What do you? T they take SATs in China, and it's jumping all over the place." Meanwhile, we've got this loud sound uh, that's sort of kind of pushing its way through. And David, really, like you, I mean, your your observations very is correct. It's sort of setting the stage to say to all of you, pay attention because this is this is this is the tempo by which the dialogue is going to clip at. Um, and then <clears throat> once. Once we establish, you know, there's a lot of information that's, that gets established in that opening scene about his insecurities and, and um, you know, the sort of odd, meaningless desire to be part of these, these final clubs and, and, you know, sort of try to fit in and make himself and sort of be something that he, he obviously feels that he deserves to be. And, and, the, if, and she should feel lucky that she's going to be dragging him along. And she, that's, that was like the key. There's like, what are you talking about? And so David really r wanted that. Um, and then when they, the, these guys, uh, they handed over all these wonderful pieces of music. And, and um, you know, we kind of happened upon that track by accident, really, because um, David said, well, well, we got all these tracks. And what, we, what should we do? And, and um, we had a few tracks from the Ghost record. And then... Every single piece that that they gave us, we put it in, and we're just like, oh, that's a, that's actually really nice. You know, that one of them has a, a rhythmic quality to it. Another one had sort of a percolating sort of wheels in his head quality to it that fit him running, and and they were all really, they all work differently in their own way. And um, and then we, that one piece that you, we have here, uh, this is the one hand covers bruise, the 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 one that's in the film. Yeah. Um, we just by accident sort of put it up to the image and it all, for some odd reason worked because it was so unexpected because normally you want to your instinct is always to say oh it's the beginning of a movie let's get everybody you know in tempo let's get this thing going and you know there's like this rhythm to it let's get it going so there's like a natural propensity to so, sort of want to set the stage for a tempo uh, but when that piece of music got put on uh, we all sort of reacted to it in a way that was like, wow, this is not, 
this isn't what we were expecting, but it's very beautiful. And, and what David really liked about it um, was the piano sort of was the, was the character of Mark Zuckerberg that even though despite the fact that he's this and you know he becomes this billionaire at the end of the film he's still this little tiny person that's very fragile on the inside and those piano notes sort of I think to all of us really sort of say that about his character and I think that that's what what David really got excited about with that piece. And was that a dramatic shift from when you and Atticus saw that first 40 minutes? I, I, I can't imagine what it was tempt with. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, the, the big uh, lightning strike moment for me was we turn in these, I think about 15 pieces of music. But the intention was, Here's, a, here's some menu items to choose from. See, see Are these they, fully developed, uh, these yeah, musical were, pieces, or fully mixed, or? Rough mixes, three to five They're minutes perfect. long piece. And uh, I was waiting for the email back to say it sucks or it's good or, you know, <laughs> but I was fully expecting that this would be the first of several trips to the well creatively. And again, what Atticus and I were doing, we're thinking, okay, we need something that sounds like a spark of creativity, you know, of, of acceleration, of that you've got a good idea and you want to follow it to its course, and that excitement of, for example. Or the piece that we're referring to now, Hand Covers Bruise, that felt noble and it felt majestic and it felt flawed and vulnerable and, and really kind of sad in a, with this bold melody. But we didn't envision them in any particular specific scenes. I'm just working off read, reading the script a few times and getting an, an idea of what I thought the impre my impression of the film was going to be. So I hear back from David, and he said, Psh, I, don't, "I don't have any comments that are bad. I'm, you know, this is a really good first draft." That's kind of unusual for David to. to, to I don't respond. know if he's just being nice or <laughs> not. True, you know, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> but he says. Um, we're, we're doing a really early rough cut screening for some people at the studio. Come by in a couple of days and come to Sony and, and watch it. But be prepared, I've tempted in stuff all through it. So in that screening is when I first saw that piece in that title segment. And that's when I realized I got goosebumps and I felt like, okay, I've been thinking in a very linear, it needs, just like Ren said, it needs something up-tempo to establish this film as this. As soon as I saw that piece in there, it it made the whole film seem radically different to me. It felt like, oh, this is really? not this kind of movie, it's this kind of movie. You know, because in the rough cut, what you originally asked me, it, I forget what it was, and you probably know, because I've been asked this a million times, and I, I don't remember, but it was something that felt like, a, when I saw that first 40 minutes in, in, in David's editing suite, it, it was, was... an Elvis Costello song David loved. Is that what it was? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I've shortchanged that in other interviews because I do love Elvis Costello, but it felt very, it made the movie feel <laughs> casual. It felt like a, a, a college, it, it felt like an, ah, oh, it's going to be a kids at college doing college kid stuff. You know, it's, it's this kind of movie. It kind of feel good, John Hughes-ish almost. <laughs> and it's, you know, <laughs> and hearing our piece in there, it really, um, I think it really makes the movie feel differently, especially coming out of that uh, the bar breakup scene. It really, it really kind of sets that um, person alone, surrounded by a crowd kind of feeling, which is kind of what Mark is. I mean, he's surrounded by all these people, but he is ultimately this this isolated guy. Um, can you can you talk to it? Let's talk about um, um, the. The one classical music uh, reference, I know that when I saw um, the regatta race, the first thing that I went to was A Clockwork Orange and, um, and Kubrick and, and, and using all the Beethoven. Um, how did In the Hall of the Mountain King uh, come about? Uh, well, uh, that scene uh, uh, in row five, it actually was the last thing that was filmed. In fact, the whole movie was constructed um, and was already edited and, and largely mixed, with the exception of the of the regatta scene. And the reason why that that scene was was last was because it, David actually wanted to go on location and shoot it, and it was coming up up to towards October when we were going to release the film. So that was at the very end, and and he didn't. <clears throat> 
you know, he'd call us up and he'd say, well, you know, what should this be? And, and um, you know, the instinct was sort of, well, you know, it could be sound, it could be music, we don't really know, how are you gonna film it? And and he said, well, you know, over cranking and, you know, short focal length and a lot of, um, you know, just sort of visceral. And I said, well, that feels like a music piece, really. And he said, you know, okay, well, that sounds great. And then when he went over to um, to England and, and he got there and everybody's wearing these hats and, you know, they're all dressed up. And he was like, this is so, uh, this is like this Edwardian weird scene over here. And, and I you know, just, just find some music, you know. And so he asked us to find some music and, and that's how we found that piece. We just sort of happened upon it. And, and then... Um, uh, uh, and then he he found you know there were all sorts of different you know we well, that's normally how we start we'll just start referencing we'll just sort of dig and find something and see what works and and he responded to to the uh, to hall, in the hall of the mountain king and then he thought what if these guys were to uh, and kind of in a similar way that you're describing this Kubrick instinct you know there was sort of a, maybe a little bit of that but then. Um, but then you know they they took it into a different place completely. So how did how did you guys approach it? Did you had was there a recording uh, by a symphony that maybe you started with, or did you start playing the? Well, the instruction. Well, we just gotten done saying, hey, this scoring film shit's easy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And I think uh, as those words were leaving my mouth, we got the, the call saying, what if you did Hall of the Mountain King as if uh, Walter or Wendy, Wendy Carlos did it in a kind of 70s synth? And then you can tell the tragic tale from there. Um, well, it was, it was definitely the most challenging bit. And, it, and that's a melody that can become infuriating. <laughs> after well, it's one that repeat. we all know. We've all heard it so many times in one way. Well, you've heard it now more than yeah, you definitely more than you. <laughs> no, we just went down the wrong path. We our our version. We, we I literally did a very um, just corny sounding synth version, and and that ate up two weeks of the three that it took us to do that piece. <laughs> then finally, we eased up on the literal interpretation of Wendy Carlos, and it um, turned into what we think it's turned out really yeah. good. You know, but it was just really mimicking listening to an orchestral version and trying to reorchestrate it using a variety of um, synthetic sounds. It made it sound a bit more evil. Now, I, I want to go back to something that you talked about before when you wrote these, these kind of swatches or sketches uh, that you submitted to these guys. Did you um, send fully mixed files to them or did you put it in separate tracks? I mean, how were you able to kind of um, take the, the pieces of the music, Ren, and apply them in a variety of different ways um, throughout the film. Well, the what they were, uh, uh, Trent was describing those initial seventeen tracks or whatever it was. Those are just MP3s, fully mixed, and they were they sounded great. You know, these guys are very modest and they're like they were rough, but I thought they were really beautiful sounding. And David was so excited about it, and um, uh, just just jumping off the. I mean, you know, because you know it's a filmmaker. You got to remember, you know, it's, he's. The filmmaker is, you know, he's a visualist, obviously, but he knows the importance of, of beautiful music, and he knows, and, and particularly in this film, he knew how important the music was going to be for his film. And so when, um, when that initial moment came when Trent and Atticus weren't going to be able to do the film, there was it was really hard, actually, for, uh, for David, because... You know, he was he was so excited about this possibility of a, of a collaboration, uh, and so when it happened, it, uh, and these tracks showed up, these seventeen tracks, um, it was just like the cavalry coming over the hill for the film. I mean, it really was. It it, it really kind of just brought this this wonderful uh, selection of material that we could just have and, and experiment with with the film. Did, did you have the freedom to kind of deconstruct those tracks instrument by instrument? No, not or? really, no. I mean, we didn't need to. They all seemed to work beautifully on their own. And what, w the most, what we focused on was just sort of figuring out when and where. That was sort of the first initial pass. And if I may jump in, we, uh, 
when we were um, arranging them, what we'd do is um, these, these weren't structured in terms of verse, chorus, whatever. There might be, say, 10 parts in each track, and we would arrange them in a sense where if they wanted something that was the non-rhythmic section, there'd be a segment of that. Kind of intelligently giving them the components in a listenable form. And, and I've got to say, again, in the whole process of this, I mean, I have to give all the credit to Ren in terms of when we saw where they'd placed the music, Again, we turned this stuff in thinking that, um, initially thinking, let's just see if any of it is close to what he's hoping to get. Then we realized, whoa, I mean, the lion's share of the composition has been finished, and they've chosen, Ren's chosen, um, what sits in the film. It really, it's like, we were stunned. You know, Then the work, a, a more traditional scoring kicked into gear, where we'd be, now let's, fix this piece to be a better version of that. Or now let's orchestrate things around dialogue and work to the cut and back and forth. And it was a very fluid exchange of them cutting to rhythmic elements we've given them and back and forth we would rearrange so musical phrases still could make sense around dialogue and things like that. And when you were reworking this, were you starting to... Uh, one of the amazing things about the film is because we're jumping in time and space so many different times. I mean, sometimes we're in one deposition room and there's a jump cut and we end up in another deposition room, but it's a different time, but we know it because of the sound and sometimes the music. So did you guys write specific to transitions, to, to jump cuts? And I mean... You did an amazing job of always leading the audience's ear so we knew instantly where we were. We didn't have to kind of figure it out. We weren't confused. In my opinion, that's sound design. That's Ren. That was, there was no real conscious effort on our part. Did, did you try to restructure some of the music? I mean, mostly it's the, the ambient sounds and the backgrounds that you well, and Michael I mean, you're probably talking about. On. You're talking about placement and time, and I think that sound... The sound sort of created these vertical edges so that we would, you know, in the jump cuts, we would always know where we were in terms of space. Because you're, you're right, when we're, when we're in this deposition room and we jump cut over here, there's a lot of sort of frenetic editing. And then the frenetic editing compounded with the frenetic writing compounded with Fincher's sort of, you know, I mean, he likes to have multiple angles and a lot of cutaways and so on. So there's a lot of things to focus on as as you're watching the film. And so the sound, I think, just helps create those vertical edges so that we hear, you know, the reverb on their voices is different. The tones of the rooms are different. So we can sense, oh, okay, now we're at this place. We're, and we call it, you know, we're basically going back and forth between the two depositions ro deposition rooms, the Woody deposition room and the one we called the glassy deposition room. And so we, we created the different sound treatments of the dialogue and the sound effects for those. Um, and so those are the real vertical elements. If anything, the music did, it, it, it was the binder. I mean, it was the thing that created the continuous, it was the story and it was the emotion of it. So I think the sound effects were very much just there to kind of help help the audience know where we were so we weren't confused, but really emotionally everything came from the music. How about, how about the dance club? Did you, uh, um, was, was, that a, was that a composition of you guys or did you do anything to it? Did you? Uh, no, that was or? when we, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, did you choose that room? Or yeah, the, I, Ruby, the, the yeah. Ruby Sky uh, Lounge? You yeah, we that's a club, that's a real club called Ruby Sky that's in San Francisco that, um, um, and so we we researched it and we called up the club and we got the playlist from 2003 and then we got all <laughs> the songs and then we just picked and we again similarly to their music we just said well this one this one oh that one so that's how we kind of arrived at it and then of course um, we created a sort of a geological sort of sound of sound treatment of that music. We did a real bassy version, we did a real distorted version, we did a harmonically screwed up two kilohertz piercing through the ear version, and then that, then we stacked all of those into that scene. Uh, and that's how that, that music was created there. It's sort of like a sound effect. Do you, do you guys have a particular moment in the film, maybe one that's maybe not quite so obvious, where picture and sound and music all just came together and you went, holy. 
I'll say the scene in the uh, the bathroom scene where they're having sex, and then he runs into uh, Erica, and it turns sour. Yeah. Um, I I particularly like the way the music we did for that, um, which was a bit of a battle to keep it in the film because it was another um, just found piece of music that was going to be in the bathroom scene, like something that would be playing at the club. But with some arm twisting, we got. Uh, we ended up rolling off all the low ends, so when they're in the bathroom, it sounds like something different, but I like the way that turns into something else and follows the scene mm -hmm. quite nicely. Um, that, and also, um, for me, when he solves the equation in the classroom, I like the way it ominously oh, yeah. leads into him meeting the uh, Winklevi. Yeah, the <laughs> Winklevi. Atticus? Um, <clears throat> I like the bit uh, where it all goes wrong for Justin Timberlake at the end, you know, and it, it kind of creeps in, and he's got his inhaler, and uh, you know, has done the coke, and <laughs> you just get the sense. And I think it also is interesting where it cuts from that with that piece of music to Zuckerberg, you know, and he holds a card and stuff. But my favourite moment is actually the first where it cuts at the beginning from the bar to that first sound of uh, hand covers ruse. I just yeah. think it's really powerful. And I think in terms of like the space, spatial type of, you know, when you're in that bar, you feel like you're in, your bar, in that bar. And then it suddenly dries up and you're just not sure where you are, you know, with that sound. I think it's a great moment. Yeah. And that sound was, um, we had a violin that we sampled bowing real quickly and we put it into a granular, infinite reverb thing, which still sounded, it's, what I like about it is it sounds unnatural, but yet familiar and organic. And that was one of the things when we, we were mentioning rules at the beginning of this thing, we thought, trying to respond to David's desire for a synthetic element to the score and synthesizers and a coldness and a kind of um, iciness, but keeping something that felt always human and frail and imperfect, and sometimes that's a piano that would anchor things. And sometimes it would be the choice of sounds that we would surround things with. And I think what you're mentioning, when it first kicks in, it, you're instantly in a kind of strange... And, and David's place. famous for um, that sound that the characters hear, that's off screen. The, you know, what, what, world, what, what about the rest of the world that could care less about who these characters are? What's going yeah, on around? He was, that, that's sort of the, the etude of piano and flip-flops, yeah. that part of the movie, because... These guys were they were they were being uh, asked by David to explore these different piano sounds and and that was uh, that was a big journey that the music went on and then the sound effects we were we were also being you know every time Mark was running he, he wanted to hear every leaf crunch and then the flip flop banging up against Zuckerberg's le you know his his heel and and uh, all the voices and so. Um, but you know, I think that that um, in a way, it's it, the way that he makes his imagery um, and that scene so beautifully f uh, composed visually because um, it's so very dark. It's hard. It's very hard to see it, and particularly when you're working on it. When we first get our uh, our video copies of it, it's you know how it is. I call it granola vision because it's <laughs> it's crunchy and it's crushed, and you can't really see all the detail of it. And, you, and, and every time you think, what is this problem? Why is everything so dark? You know, and then you realize, of course, it's because it isn't. It's, it's beautifully exposed and it's beautifully lit. It's just that you have to be in, you know, in the right environment to, to see it. And um, so I think it's, you're right. I mean, it's one of my favorite moments, too, because it is all these little tiny things trying to define Zuckerberg's character you know, kind of the, his heartbeat is this piano and this loneliness. And then everything else is just sort of, He's not really, a, he's not really um, connected to the world at all. I mean, he's sort of just on the periphery of it all. You know, he, so all the people that are having fun in the other dorms or these parties and whatnot, he's, he's not really connected to that. And so I think that's what I think we were so excited about yeah. in that opening scene. Um, well, before we uh, say goodnight, I, uh, I wanted to ask you guys, you know, there's so many conflicting narratives in this film. Um, and it, you know, I even think Aaron and uh, Aaron Sorkin and David Fincher talk about how that they're not telling the truth because there isn't one the truth. There's at least three truths. 
as you guys were working on this, and now you've probably seen it a number of times before doing Q and A's and things like that. Do your um, allegiances shift? Do you do you have different feelings about these characters and who did who wrong and who betrayed who? Does it does it shift at all? I mean, for me personally, I started you know from the script. You can't help but think, wow, this guy's an asshole. <laughs> you know, and I think the first time you see the film, you still kind of feel that way because you're taken aback by how um, how abrasive he can be. And you're kind of stunned at some of the cold uh, behavior, especially towards Eduardo. Um, but, I mean, as we were working on it, I know what we started thinking about was if it's a, if, if it's a movie about creativity and the pursuit of creativity in its purest, chasing that idea of you want to make something that's important and you want it to have no compromises, and you'll you'll give up anything to pursue that. If you look at it through that through those through that through those glasses, um, it slightly takes on a different meaning to me, anyway. And then I know in the score we were trying to get trying to give it a humanity and a a sense of sadness at times that ref made him a little less of just an asshole. And you may take the side of you know what he was. Pursuing, which in, in itself is, is, I think, something that's um, noble. And that singular creative passion one has uh, in any kind of creative endeavor. Um, you know, you're driven, and sometimes you make decisions that you don't think you would have made otherwise. Right, and that have consequences. Yeah. Atticus, how about, how about you? How <clears throat> well, I mean, I do think just from speaking to friends and, you know, and, and between us, even with Ren, you know, the, it, it is a film where, you know, like you said, um, that David and Aaron said, there is no clear truth, you know what I mean? And in, in one sense, I can, you know, when I first saw it, I think, you know, it was that aspect of, you know, feeling, you know, yeah, this guy's an asshole and blah, 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 you know, and we're dealing with Facebook and this, that, and the other. But <clears throat> on repeated, viewings and I gotta say with this film it didn't it wasn't I never felt I never got bored, you know what I mean? By the end of working on this for several months, I could still happily watch the scenes that we were scoring and you know there's a lot that happens actually if you don't look exactly where the camera's looking. Um but I felt like after repeated it was kind of like that thing of someone who just doesn't feel good enough ever and on that kind of level I think it's something that we can all we all know that feeling and I felt like some empathy to a certain extent you know at least on an emotional level I'm certainly not saying I think he did the right thing because you know I'm not going to say I go as far as saying I think he did the wrong thing because I don't think there is oh, you right. know what I mean yeah. yeah and I also think Ultimately, would the Winklevoss, you know, come on, I, I, you know, again, who knows? Yeah. Ren, how about you? Yeah, I vacillate too. I mean, you know, like, you know, some people go, oh, Eduardo, poor Eduardo. And then you think, well, I mean, he did all right. I mean, you know, one, I mean, $19,000. And, you know, you could argue that you know, getting point zero three six percent of twenty billion dollars, whatever the comp, that's not bad for <laughs> six to nine months worth of work in one way of thinking. You know, if you're if you're Mark Zuckerberg and you think, well, this guy was never around and he was off in New York doing this other thing, but of course that's not exactly true either. You know, so there, I think that's what's so fun about the way that it's written is that you get this you can you can kind of see it from some from each perspective a little bit and you can and that's what's fun about the film is that afterwards we can all go out to dinner and kind of go but i really think that he was a jerk you know and, and you can kind of have those fun conversations but uh kind of makes you look at facebook in a whole new way though doesn't it <laughs> I, I don't want to go there <laughs> ladies and gentlemen the guys from the social network